the more we fix our eyes on our desires, the more it becomes an idol. But the moment you realize God is more important, then you'll be able to say, okay, Lord, I'm gonna dedicate this to you. We're gonna continue our series on loving God, and this is really a life of worship. That's what you mean when you say you love God. It's a life of worship. In fact, you can't worship someone if you don't love, for example, God. You can't worship Him if you don't love Him, if you don't have a personal relationship with Him. So a life of worship, the bottom line there is love. The question that we wanna answer is this. Let's read this question. How do we love God now more than our, what? earthly desires because the reality is all of us we have desires right we have wants we have dreams we have goals and there's a tendency for these things that we love we love them more than God there's a tendency for these things to focus on these things more than to focus on God so how do you really offer and dedicate something to the Lord and eventually you will realize, okay, Lord, this is yours. You're way better than all of these things because it's easier said than done. And I'm so glad that the character that we're going to look at did just that. She offered her best to the Lord. And how did she do it? Three things that we're going to learn from her life. You dedicate your best by number one, you be in God's presence. Number two, you set your joy in God. And number three, you thank Him always. What's our message again? Love God, dedicate your best. Again, tell your seatmate. One, three, go. Love God. So, let's go to the first one. We need to be in God's presence. You know, why is this very important? Why is this the start? Because we can't dedicate something important to us, to someone we don't know. Right? How will you dedicate something, let's say your goal, or this is, this is my goal, Lord, this is my dream, I'm going to dedicate it to you, and you don't know God. How will you do that? And I realize a lot of people cannot dedicate what's important to them because they don't know God. If you don't know God, you won't trust Him. If you don't know God, you don't believe in what He says. But if you know God, then the rest will follow. That's why Hannah, the character that we're going to look at, that's what happened in her life. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 1. We read this earlier. So there was a certain man from Ramathaim Zophim, from the hill country of Ephraim, and this is the husband of Hannah. And his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham. So that's the background. He's an Israelite, part of the Jewish country. He had, verse 2, he had two wives. Elkanah had two wives. The first one, the name of the one was Hannah. And the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children. Now, scholars would say the reason why Elkanah married again because Hannah had no children. She couldn't get pregnant. And because for them during that time, they need to have descendants to continue the, you know, the generation, Elkanah married somebody else to continue the line. So Penina had children, Hannah had no children. So this man, what do we know about their family? Let's look at the next verse. This man would go up from this, his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts. So most probably, this guy and their family was devoted. Now, it doesn't mean because he's coming back to, the, to worship physically, it means he's devout. No, but we can see later on in the story that most especially Hannah was a committed follower of God. She really has faith in the Lord. She believes in the Lord. And she was devout, devoted, devoted follower of God. And look at the next one. So the two sons of Eli, the priest was there. Hophni and Phinehas. Eli also were there. And they were worshiping the Lord together. And look at here. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed. So they do this regularly together with their family. He would give portions to Penina, his wife. And to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, look who's the favorite. He would give a double portion. That's why it's a complicated family. There was insecurity. There was conflict, comparison. And look at the problem of Hannah. Even though she was receiving the double portion, he, you know, his, his, her husband loved her dearly. But, what's the next line? The Lord had closed her womb. 
Now, if you don't know God, this is very challenging. And this is a very important theological truth that all of us need to learn. What is that truth? Let's say you have a goal, you have a dream. Your dream is to have a successful business, and that's a good dream. But God has the final say. Look at that, though. God can say, no, I'm going to close that business. Let's say you want to have kids, but God can say, no, I won't allow you to get pregnant. Let's say for the singles here, you want to get married, and God will say, sorry, you're not going to get married this year or next year. That's challenging. If we don't know God and God says no, how are we going to respond? That's why being in the presence of God is so important because things like this is going to be challenging. How will I respond? Magtatampo ka talaga kay Lord. You're going to have bitterness. You're going to start to get angry at life, at God because of what's happening. And to make matters worse, look at what's happening to Hannah. So the Lord closed her womb. And then look at the next verses. Her rival, Septenina, would provoke her bitterly too. Imagine that. Ina asar pa siya. What's happening there? Most probably, Penina was saying, well, yeah, you get the double portion, but you don't have kids, you're barren, you won't have any generations after you. When you're dead, you're gone, but I have many kids. Imagine the pressure. Year after year, huh? Did my passage? It happened year after year. As often as they went to the house of the Lord, ba? She's being teased, irritated. And guess what? Up until today, you know, some of us, we experience certain things like this. The pressures from the world. Aside from being irritated because of her, you know, the other wife, Elkana, her husband said to her, I want the guys to read this. Basahin natin all of the guys. One, two, three, go. Hannah, why? Lakasan nyo naman, guys. Let's read this loudly. Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Eta, Am I not better to you than 10 sons? It's like the guy was saying, aren't you glad you married me? guilt trip ba? It's like a guilt trip to Hannah. Why are you sad? I'm more than enough. Now I know Hannah should be grateful that she, she is married, right? She should be grateful. But still the feeling, the pressure of the world from other people could lead her to do crazy things. That's why, look at this statement. If we don't learn how to love God more than our desires, the pressures of the world will push us to idolatry. Because when we look at social media, when we look at the things that we're seeing in this world, it, this pressure is strong. Why are you still single? You just do this. Why don't you have kids? You do this. Why are you not successful in your business? You do this. Why are you not successful in your career? You do this. It gives us the pressure to focus so much on those things that it becomes our idol. That's why we need to be in the presence of God. And that's why I, what I appreciate with Hannah. You know what happened to Hannah? Instead of becoming irritated, instead of becoming, you know, just so helpless, run away, respond in a negative way, look at what Hannah did in verses 9 and 10. Hannah rose after eating, so she ate, she calmed herself down, and drink her in Shiloh, she was there worshiping the Lord, Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. And look at verse 10. Let's read verse 10. She, Hannah, greatly distressed. What did she do? Prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She went to God. She bowed down on her and he's crying before the Lord. Lord, you know my desire. I'm so broken. I need your help. And that's totally okay. It's okay to cry out to the Lord. You're not, you know, you cannot manipulate God. He knows you. And what's important is you're honest before the Lord. It's okay to go to God. I like this statement because the reason why Hannah went to the Lord, because she knows the Lord. Because in the Lord's presence, look at what we're going to receive. Peace, comfort, and clarity can only be found in the presence of God. Right? Peace. You want to have genuine peace? You, because of your concerns, you go to God. It's okay if you have concerns and you go to other people. That's okay. But the comfort that they will give, even though they're listening to you, it's not enough compared to the peace of God. That's why there's this statement in Philippians chapter 4 that the peace of God surpasses all understanding. Those are the moments where you can say, Lord, 
I know you're not answering my prayers, my desires, but I have peace. And you can only find that in God. The peace that surpasses all understanding. The comfort that in spite of you have not having what you dream of, what you desire, you're still comforted. And the clarity. Because usually if we dream of something, we have prayer concerns, of, 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 let's say there's something that we really want. We do everything that we can to reach it. But sometimes the things that we do is not helping us. That's why we need clarity. We need God's guidance. What do you want me to do, Lord? What do you want me to do with this desire? And then he gives us step by step of the things that we need to do. That's the presence of the Lord. As you pour out your heart, your soul, your desire to him, he's going to reveal to you if it's a wrong desire. He's going to reveal to you if it's something that is really bad for you. Because he knows you intimately. He knows what's wrong for you. He knows what's good for you. He knows the right decisions that you need to make and the wrong decisions you are about to make. He knows that. That's why we need to go to him in the presence of God. We can realize the comfort, the peace, and also the clarity when it comes to our direction in life. That's what Hannah was doing. She was in the presence of God. And here's the promise. When you're in the presence of God, because again, you can't dedicate if you don't know God. When you're in the presence of God, it's easier now to dedicate because the second thing that's going to happen is this. You will realize that God is the source of ultimate joy. That's why we set our joy in God. Because the tendency is our joy is set on our desires. If our joy is only for these things, then it's starting to become an idol. Look at Hannah and how she responded. But let's read this phrase first. When we are in the presence of God, you know why we're going to have joy? Because we will realize in his presence that God is more than enough. You won't realize that if you're not in his presence. But when you're in his presence, then you'll realize, oh my Lord, Peace is found only in you. The joy is only in you. Look at what happened to Hannah. Eli answered, okay, you're not drunk pala. Go in peace, my child. May the God of Israel grant your petition. So Eli prayed for Hannah. And then Hannah said, let your maid servant find favor in your sight. So keep praying for me, Eli. I really have this desire. And look at what happened. The woman went her way and ate. And look at the last line. And her face was no longer sad. Now, why is that line there? Why did God want that line to be there? That she was no longer sad. I believe it's to emphasize to all of us, to the readers, that you can have joy even though you don't get the desires of your heart. You can be content even though you don't have these things. Because God is the ultimate source of that. And after she was joyful, no longer sad, look at what she did afterwards. Let's read verse 11. Then she made a vow. I really believe the reason why the first line was there first, the first line where it says she, has, she was no longer sad, before the vow. Because usually, sometimes when we make a vow to the Lord, we bargain. Usually it's out of frustration. It's out of we just want our desires. But not with Hannah. She made a vow out of joy. Because she found joy in the Lord. That's why she said, look at what she said. Oh Lord, Yahweh, Lord of hosts, if you indeed look on the affliction. And she was honest. She was still afflicted. There were still hurts. There were still desires in her heart. Of your maidservant, remember me, not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son. And what did she say? I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. You know what she's saying here? Lord, my son is yours. Because when she says, my son will be with you all the days of your life, in other words, he's gonna bring, she's going to bring her son to the temple of the Lord. He's going to serve there and she's not going to see her anymore. That's surrendering. That's dedicating. And look at the next line. A razor shall never come on his head. What does that mean? 
Because usually those people that can only serve in the temple are Levites. They're not Levites. So she's making a Nazarite commitment that my son, if you give him to me, I'm going to commit him to you. A Nazarite commitment. She, he is your son already, Lord. I will take care of him maybe in the first few months or first few years, but he is yours. That's why she did it out of joy because she was willing to say, Lord, whatever happens, my son will be yours. And look at the next part. Look at the next part. Then they arose early in the morning and what did Hannah do? And worship, right? Worship God, thanking God even though she doesn't have the answer yet. She was saying, okay, Lord, whatever you answer, it's okay. I'm totally okay. I will worship you no matter what. So what happened to Hannah and Elkanah? So they returned to their house in Ramah, and Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife. And what happened? Look at the next one. The Lord remembered her. And in due time. You know, God is really good. I mean, God could, you know, just continue to close her womb. And God can do that because he's God, he's sovereign. But God remembered Hannah. And eventually, Hannah had conceived. She gave birth to a son and she named him Samuel. You know that he, the Hebrew word Samuel, it means God has heard. Meaning to say, God has heard my cry. God has heard my petition. It's a beautiful name. That's the name of our youngest son. And look at what, what Hannah said. Because I have asked him of the Lord. God has heard me. And that's why she's dedicating her son to the Lord. Then the man Elkanah went up with all his household to offer to the Lord. The yearly sacrifice, pay his vow, the regular thing that he was doing. But Hannah did not go up. You know why? She said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned. Then I will bring him to the Lord that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. You know, the weaning process for a Hebrew child is usually 18 months to five years. So imagine if you're the mom. Imagine that, that you're the mom, you're Hannah. And this is your only son. You've waited for it for years. You've been praying for that boy. And now the boy is there. You're holding it. And now there's this weaning process. Imagine the temptation to say to God, Lord, this boy is really cute. Um, can I just not fulfill my vow? It's easy to back out. It's one thing to make a promise and say, Lord, I'm going to do this. It's another thing to fulfill it. But not with Hannah. Look at what happened with Hannah. Even Elkanah, Elkanah, her husband said to her, do what seems best to you. In other words, he's saying, it's okay. He's my son also. Let's dedicate him to the Lord. Imagine even Elkanah was worshiping God by dedicating his son. Let's look at the next part. Afterwards, they went now, the right age of Samuel. They went to the place of worship. They slaughtered the bull, brought the boy to Eli. And here's Hannah. Imagine this, going to Eli. And she said, oh my Lord, as your soul lives, uh, Eli. I am the woman who stood here beside you. I was praying to the Lord. And now here, Here's my boy. I prayed for him. The Lord has given me my petition, which I ask of him. And now I'm dedicating this to the Lord. Just imagining it, it's difficult to surrender, dedicate something very precious. But look at what Hannah did. She fulfilled her promise. She went to the temple. She talked to the priest Eli. She said, I have dedicated him to the Lord as long as he lives. In other words, I'm ready not to see him for the rest of my life. Hannah was ready not to see Samuel. And then Samuel worshiped the Lord there. I believe the reason why Hannah was able to do this, fixing our eyes. The more we fix our eyes on our desires, the things that are best for us, those important things, family, health, relationships, getting married, having children, successful business, whatever that thing is, the more we fix our eyes on those things, the more it becomes an idol. But the more we veer away and we start looking to Jesus, the more we are able to dedicate it to the Lord. You can't dedicate something if you're always looking at it. You can't. You can't dedicate something if your mind and heart is just so glued to that thing. 
But the moment you realize God is more important, then you'll be able to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to dedicate this to you. And that's what Hannah did. You know what we will realize when we're in the presence of God? Let's read this together. The presence of God ultimately what? Satisfies our greatest need and our greatest longing. You need love? God is the only one who can fully satisfy that. You need forgiveness? God is the one who can do that. You, we, you need grace? God is the one who can give that. Provision, healing, acceptance, and most importantly, eternal life? Only in God's presence can we find these things. What's our message again? Love God, dedicate your best. Now I've asked one of the, uh, the, one of the parents of our campus missionaries, three of our campus missionaries, to share her testimony. My husband suffered a massive heart attack on October 10, 2006. He was revived after 18 minutes, much longer than the ideal five minutes. He was in a coma on life support for almost three weeks. It was a very difficult time for all of us. Resources were depleting. My in-laws had to sell their house where we also live to pay for my husband's hospital and various medical bills. I felt like I was facing a wall with nowhere to go and no hope in sight. It was during those times when my dear cousin reached out and invited me to attend CCF Dawn Watch, an early prayer service in St. Francis Square. She brought me to the D group she was a part of. Everything was new to me with all the Bible readings and time of prayer. I immediately shared the gospel to my husband that very same day. I asked if he understood what I said. Then he raised his eyebrows twice, a clear sign that he did. Then exactly after a week, God took him home on January 29, 2008. Grief and uncertainty overwhelmed me as a new believer in the faith. I was a widow at 42 with five young children. I didn't have work. How will I provide for them? Then I saw how God stepped into our life and proved himself faithful to us. He used people, some were not even from church, for us to receive his loving provisions. Not a day passed that we did not have food on our table. He gave us our own home. We did not need to rent anymore. My children were granted academic, financial, and varsity scholarships and are all now college degree holders by the grace and goodness of God. After my second daughter, Angela, graduated, she shared to me that she had a calling from the Lord to work full-time in ministry as a campus missionary. She wanted to give her first fruits from college to God, and so I gave her my blessing. After a month, my third mo daughter, Monica, who was then about to graduate, asked me if she can also apply as a campus missionary. But I said no, thinking that having her older sister as a campus missionary was enough. She brought me out for lunch and shared to me how God was calling her to become a campus missionary in her devotions with God and asked me to pray about it. I was hesitant to say yes. I was thinking that using what she has learned in school will give her better opportunities and a secure future. But God spoke to me clearly in Matthew 9, 37 to 38. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. With this, I gave my blessing for her to apply as a campus missionary. Then, after a few years, my fourth daughter, Camille, also graduated from college, and she shared to me 
that in her devotions with God during the past days, the Lord has been speaking to her to work full-time in ministry. She asked me to pray about it. I was surprised to hear this a third time. In all honesty, I did not pray nor open my Bible and instead opened my social media. And lo and behold, I read posted in big, bold letters God's message. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. I could not believe what I had read. I was hoping my daughters will be blessed by the Lord with work that pays well so they can help with the finances at home as I didn't have a stable job. But God spoke loud and clear. I couldn't say no to him. God's plan will always be much better than mine. We continued to receive his blessings in so many ways, far more than I can imagine. At home, I hear my daughter share the gospel each time youth services are done online, do Bible studies with students and their D groups. I see their passion and dedication in accomplishing God's will and plan for their lives. They have shared to me that all of them have the same calling verse, Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. And he did, he did as what he had promised. God has been faithful to me and my kids, never failing to take care of us and provide for all our needs since day one. And so my three daughters and my son-in-law are all actively working for several, several years now as our campus missionaries in various campuses, reaching the youth with the gospel. They are intentionally discipling the next generation for the expansion of God's kingdom here on earth for the praise and glory of his name. I remember one of my daughters telling me years ago that God took their papa so that they will know who their true father is. If I didn't have Jesus in my life, if I did not accept him as my Lord and Savior, I would still be living in darkness and sin, bringing my children along with me. But God reached out his hand, rescued us, and wrote his story in our lives. I am Kakay Lipana, a witness proclaiming how amazing, how good, how gracious, how faithful our God is. To Him be all the glory and praise. What's our message again? Love God, dedicate your best. So how do we dedicate our best? How do we do that? The first step, okay, be in the presence of the Lord. The more you are in God's presence, then He will be your ultimate joy. Because you, re you and I will realize he is more than enough. And then eventually, last one, is we're going to be able to thank him. Thank him always, regardless if he answers yes or no to our prayers. Because that is worship. Look at this definition. Worship means, it also means gratefulness to God no matter how he answers our prayers. Meaning to say, even if God says, no, you're not going to get married, I will still give him thanks. No, you're not going to have kids, I will still give him thanks. No, your business is not going to be as successful as you want it to, but I will give thanks. It doesn't mean we don't give our best. We still give our best. We still do our part. But if God says no, we will worship him and give him thanks. Look at the prayer of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 2. I love this prayer. Imagine, after she dedicated Samuel, this is what she said. She said, my heart exalts in the Lord. In other words, she, she doesn't know what's going to happen in the future. She just says, Lord, my son is yours. I may not be able to see him, but my heart rejoices. That's what it means, exalts in the Lord. My heart rejoices. My horn is exalted in the Lord. The word horn means God is my strength. 
He is my source of refuge. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies. Why? Maybe some of the other people were telling Hannah, why are you dedicating your son? That's crazy. You only have one son. What if you don't get any more? What you're doing is crazy. And the world cannot understand when we dedicate to God something important to us. But Hannah says, because I rejoice in your salvation. You are my salvation, God. You will provide no matter what. You are with me. Look at the next one. This is how she knows the Lord. There is no one holy like the Lord. You are holy, God. You're set apart. Your, your wisdom is way better. Your love is way better. Indeed, no one besides God. Nor is there any rock, refuge again, like our God. And look at the next one. Look at the next verse. Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth. You, you see, usually when we have a desire, we tell God, Lord, I know what I need to do. Eh? I know that if I get this, I'll be effective. So please just give it to me. I have experiences already, Lord. I know if you give this to me, or sometimes we don't go to God anymore because we have knowledge, we know a lot of things. So we brag, we boast, we don't depend on God. And what is Hannah saying here? Let's not boast. Let's not be arrogant. Why? Let's read that line. For the Lord is it's a God of knowledge. With Him, actions are weighed. What does it mean that the God, God is the God of knowledge? It means He knows better than we do. He knows us more than we know ourselves. And look at what Hannah said in her prayer. She gave example. How different are the ways of God, her th His thoughts. Those, here's an example. Those who were, who were full, meaning to say, you have plenty, meaning to say, you're successful, you're full, hire themselves out for bread. Oh, huh, wait a minute. Ko ba you're full, you have all of the things that you need. But how come you still hire yourselves for bread? Because it's still not enough. Even if you get your desires, it's still not enough. And look at the next part. But those who were hungry cease to hunger. Only God can do that. Look at the next one. Even the barren, just like Hannah, gives birth to seven. But though, though she who has many children languishes, meaning to stay frustrated, meaning to say empty, unsatisfied, miserable. Sometimes, even though we get what we want on our own, we're still living a miserable life. That's a sad life to live. All because we're not in the presence of God. All because we're not willing to dedicate our best, our all to the Lord. That's the wisdom of God. Look at the next part. The Lord kills, makes alive. He's sovereign. He brings down to shoal, to death, and raises up. Look at the next one. He makes poor and also rich. He brings low and he also exalts. And what's the key for you to experience God's favor? He, favor. Here's the key. Verses 9 to 10. He keeps the feet of his godly ones. You're in the presence of God. You're on God's side. You're worshiping the Lord. He will keep your feet securely. But the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. You're going to get lost without God. For not by might shall a man prevail. And look at the next one. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Meaning say, you go against God. You do your own thing. Ayaw mong ibigay sa akin to Lord. You don't want to give this to me. I'll do it on my own. You contend with the Lord and God will shatter you. And I don't want to be in that place. Look at the next part of the verse. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. And let's read the last parts of the prayer. Because there's something important with the last parts of the prayer. Let's read this together. He will give strength to his king, he will exalt the horn of his anointed. Now, there was no king in Israel during this time. Why is this included in the prayer? I believe God was preparing Samuel and Hannah for what Samuel will do in the future. You see, Samuel was the last judge of Israel. After him came the kings. He anointed Saul, the first king of Israel, and he anointed, connected to this verse, one of the greatest kings in Israel. And what's his name? David. David. This passage 
seems to prepare that. And Hannah doesn't know this. He's just declaring this to the Lord. She's just declaring this to the Lord. She doesn't know what's going to happen to her son. You know what I realized? We need to be men and women who will thank God for who he is and not just for what he will do for us. See, the tendency with us is, okay, Lord, thank you because you gave it to me. Thank you, my, I'm healed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, I have this. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, I got married. Thank you, Lord. But can we thank God just because of who he is? Because that is worship. What's our message again? You love God. So how do we do that? We dedicate our best. Again, tell your seatmate. One, two, three, go. Love God. And how do we dedicate our best? We be in the presence of God. Then we will learn. We set our heart, our joy only in the Lord. Because in the presence of God, we'll, we'll, we will discover He is more than enough. Then we can thank Him no matter what His answer is. Thank you, Lord. You know the blessings in the life of Hannah? Look at what happened to Hannah. And not just to Hannah, but to Samuel. Samuel was ministering before the Lord. She was, he was growing up as a boy wearing a linen ephod. And his mother, Hannah, would make him a little robe and bring it to him from year to year when she would come up with her husband to offer a yearly sacrifice. So God blessed Hannah by allowing her to visit her son on a yearly basis and still spend time. And usually when they visit, it takes days for them to stay there. So she was with her son for quite some time. God blessed her with that. And not just that, look at the next one. So Eli the priest would bless Elkanah and he prayed for Elkanah and Hannah. May the Lord give you children from this woman in place of the one she dedicated to the Lord. And they went home to their own, they went to their own home. And verse 21, the Lord visited Hannah. She conceived, gave birth to three sons and two daughters. I mean, that's a miracle from the Lord. I don't think Hannah expected any of these things. Come on, let's give glory to God. I don't think Hannah expected, yeah, I will have children. No, she just worshiped God. But God gave her. Galing, no? I really believe God is good. I know when we were singing that song, I know all of you, you're blessed with that song because you know that the goodness of God has been running after us. Because God is so good. I mean, just this example shows how good God is. God could have just continued to close her womb. But God blessed her. And look at another blessing. The last one in Hannah's life, specifically for Samuel. Look at how Samuel grew up. Samuel grew, the Lord was with him. And let none of his words fail. Whatever Samuel says, it's going to happen. And everybody obeyed him. All Israel respected him. From Dan to Beersheba, from the north to the south, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. That's how God blessed Hannah when she dedicated Samuel to the Lord. When we dedicate our best, God is honored and he will honor us as well. Look at this statement as we close. We dedicate our best to God because of who he is. Because he is God. He is sovereign. We can't go against him. He's all powerful. He deserves everything. We dedicate our best because of who he is. But we also dedicate our best because of what he has done. God did the greatest act of dedication. He dedicated his only son, Jesus, to die for your sins and my sins because he loves us. That's why we dedicate as well. And finally, we dedicate because of what he can do in our lives, through our lives, whatever we dream of. We have great plans for our kids, great plans for our lives, great plans for our business. But guess what? His plans are better. So when we dedicate it, he can work in and through that. He can work in and through our lives. But it only happens when we dedicate it to the Lord. What's our message again? You love God. You dedicate your best. Can I pray for you guys? Can we bow down our heads? Some of you, you haven't dedicated your life to Jesus. You've been going to church, but you don't know him personally. But somehow today, God is speaking to you. And now you're realizing that he is God. Jesus is God. He's the only savior. And you want to give your life to him. You want to dedicate your life to him. And if you want to do that, you pray something like this. You tell Jesus, Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for the cross. 
thank you that you love me dearly. Thank you that you rose again to prove that you are indeed God. So today, with all humility, I dedicate my life to you. I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. And from now on, I will follow you and love you with all of my heart. Thank you for your presence now in my life. Our lives, we dedicate all to you because of who you are, because of what you've done and what you're going to do. We love you, we worship you, and we honor you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you guys.